Justin in our series on Freedom's Holy Light. Again, I'd like to thank everybody here at Faith Harvest Fellowship for um, contributing uh, to these lessons. Um, this is something that has been near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate their, their uh, cooperation in this. Um, I think all of you probably have a, a binder or a booklet. That is yours. You, you can have that. Um, and so tonight, we're going to start with page 16 and go through page 19 in that booklet. Page 19 is the outline. Feel free to take notes if that's what you would like to do, uh, but that is for your use and for your purposes. We have a couple of quotes. I always start the evening out with some quotes. The first one that I want to talk about and share with you is on page 16 of your booklet. It was written by Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a Frenchman who came over to America in the 1830s because he had heard so much about America and he wanted to see what made us different than the countries in Europe. And he wrote this book called Democracy in America. And in this particular section, he's talking about Plymouth Rock. So follow along. He wrote, the rock on which the pilgrims disembarked is still shown and has become an object of veneration in the United States. I have seen fragments carefully preserved in several American cities. Does that not clearly prove that man's power and greatness resides entirely in his soul? A few poor souls trod for an instant on this rock and it has become famous. It is prized by a great nation. Fragments are venerated and tiny pieces distributed far and wide. What has become of the doorsteps of a thousand palaces? Who cares for them? On page 17 is uh, a passage taken from William Bradford's book of Plymouth Plantation, and we're going to use that in our lesson. But I want to have you flip over to page 18 then. This was on the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing, and our greatest senator of the first half of the 19th century, Daniel Webster, uh, spoke these words. He said, Our fathers were brought here by their high veneration for the Christian religion. They journeyed by its light and labored in its hope. They sought to incorporate its principles with the elements of their society and to diffuse its influence through all their institutions, civil, political, and literary. Let us cherish these sentiments and extend this influence still more widely in the full conviction that this is the happiest society which partakes in the highest degree of the mild and peaceful spirit of Christianity. Now, before we get into our lesson this evening, I thought I'd take a few moments to discuss something that's really rarely emphasized by our classroom teachers today, and that is the use of primary and secondary sources in our lessons. And for you young people that are here this evening, I want you to really pay close attention to what I'm about to say, especially if you think that you might want to further your education beyond high school. Let's define what secondary and primary sources are. Secondary sources are the writer's own interpretation of the event that is being discussed, sometimes written hundreds of years after the actual event occurred. They are opinions, hopefully based on careful research and study, but they are opinions nevertheless. I have deliberately included, beginning on page two, the three-page bibliography of my secondary sources that I am using in this course. I want you to see all the authors I've read and relied on to help me prepare these lessons. Most of the college professors today don't do this, mainly because they don't want their students to know where they have acquired the information that they're presenting. That's secondary sources. 
primary sources, on the other hand, are the writings and the documents of those people who actually lived and experienced the event in question. So when I quote from the actual writings of one of our founding fathers, or from the writings and diaries of William Bradford and Edward Winslow, for example, I am using a primary source. And because they are primary sources, they mean a whole lot more about the event or the subject in question than someone who simply uses secondary sources. I want you to understand this. I don't want some biased professor or some biased textbook publisher or writer telling me how to interpret an event, or worse, perverting that event entirely. I want the person who is actually involved in that event telling me what they did, how they did it, and why they did it whenever possible. This is why I use primary sources whenever I can. And that's why we took the time last week to actually read the Mayflower Compact, not someone else's interpretation of what it means. And that's why you should try to pay special attention when we use primary sources in our studies here. So having said that, let's begin our lesson. We left the pilgrims last week off the shores of Cape Cod on November 11, 1620, having just signed the Mayflower Compact. Now remember, this Mayflower Compact was the first time in recorded history that free men voluntarily entered into an agreement to create their own new civil government. And they did it specifically for the glory of God and for the advancement of Christianity. The next four weeks after signing that document were spent in ending out exploring expeditions. And then finally, on December 11, 1620, they discovered a place to settle. The soil was rich and fertile. There was excellent drainage. There was an open field of fire for muskets and cannon. There were not just one, but four spring-fed creeks close at hand. And the harbor was deep enough to take on ships twice the size of the Mayflower. And this was what was most puzzling to them. There were 20 acres of ground that had been cleared and was ready to plant, though all the signs indicated that for some reason, no planting had been done for several years previously. The pilgrims named this site Plymouth, and that's because that was the last town they had left in their native England. So they quickly laid out a main street, they erected a fort, and, a, and they began to build the common house. However, many of the pilgrims, weakened already from two months at sea, caught pneumonia from exposure to the elements and from sleeping on the damp, damp ground. And as you might expect, they started dying. There were six dead in December, eight in January. And the pilgrims realized very quickly that they were locked in a life or death struggle with Satan himself. This was the first time that the light of Christ had landed on this continent. And if Satan did not defeat them now, he knew reinforcements would be coming. In mid-January, the common house caught fire. They managed to save the building, but a lot of their clothing and other contents inside were burned up. And this further exposed them to the harsh New England winter. But the more adversity mounted against them, the harder they prayed. And if you read their diaries and the history of the colony, at no time did they ever give in to despair. They never experienced the jealousies that split and divide. And in contrast to Jamestown, 
as their ranks became smaller and smaller, they drew closer together. They trusted God all the more. And still the death toll mounted. In February, 17 passed. The pilgrims buried their dead at night in shallow, unmarked graves so that the Indians wouldn't know how many they had lost. Now, they'd seen the Indians from a distance, but they had had no direct contact with them. March was nearly as bad. Thirteen more died. And at one point, there were only five men in the entire colony who were well enough to care for the sick, cook, clean, and defend the fort. It got to the point where Captain Jones of the Mayflower, now, he stayed off the coast all winter long because he didn't want to go across the Atlantic in the middle of winter to go back to England. He begged them to abandon this venture and return with him to England, and all of them refused. When the worst was finally over, the pilgrims had lost 47 people, nearly half their original number. 13 out of the 18 wives died, including William Bradford's. And the colony, which was young to begin with, became even younger. For example, Bradford was only 30 years old. Edward Winslow was 25. John Alden was 21. Miles Standish was 36. And their elder statesman, William Brewster, was just 54. But compared with Jamestown's 80 to 90 percent mortality rate, they came through it remarkably well. And the key to all this was that through it all, their hearts remained soft towards God. Whether they knew they were being tested, as Bradford would later write, the high point of their week remained Sunday worship. The service was held in the blockhouse at the top of the hill. It was a building with a flat roof and a trap door so that the house could be defended. And inside, on the benches, the men would sit on the left and the women on the right, and William Brewster would preach. As Bradford wrote, he had a gift for teaching, and I quote, both powerfully and profitably, to the great contentment of the hearers and their comfortable edification. Yea, many were brought to God by his ministry. Why were so many converted? Well, you need to remember, of the original 102 colonists, only about 35 were separatists. The rest were called adventurers and they didn't have a personal relationship with Christ when they came across on the Mayflower. The adventurers were the ones that were being converted. About, I would say, the turning point of their fortunes would have occurred on a Friday in the middle of March. The men were gathered in the common house when the cry went up, Indian coming. So they went outside, and they saw a tall, well-built Indian wearing nothing but a loincloth walking up their main street. And he headed straight for the common house, and then he stopped, and he looked at the pilgrims, and he said, welcome. And the pilgrims, to put it bluntly, were absolutely startled. But at length, they replied, welcome. And then the Indian asked them in flawless English, have you got any beer? (laughs) And if they were surprised before, they were absolutely astounded now. The pilgrims looked at one another and then answered the Indian, and they said, our beer's gone, would you like some brandy? And the Indian said, yes. Now, I'd like to interject something here. I don't want you to get the idea of the stereotypical drunken Indian that you see all the time in the movies and on TV. As a matter of fact, in England at that time, beer was a more common beverage 
than even water due to the polluted streams and the rivers. And everyone, men, women, children, drank beer. Even on the Mayflower, beer was what everyone drank because it was the only drink that was safe to keep in barrels for a two-month trip. So they brought this Indian the brandy, fed him a typical English meal. Obviously, they had a million questions, but they were polite, and they waited until he finished eating. Finally, the time for answering questions came. The Indian's name was Samoset. He was a chief of the Algonquins from what is now Maine. He had been visiting in these parts for the past eight months. And Samoset apparently loved to travel. And he had learned English from various English fishing captains who had come to the Maine coast over the years to fish. And then the pilgrims asked him a crucial question. What about the Indians around Plymouth? And the answer that Samoset gave them caused everyone to thank God. You see, this area where the pilgrims were now living had always been the territory of the Pawtuxet tribe, which was a large hostile tribe who murdered every white man who had landed on their shores. But four years prior to the pilgrims' arrival, a mysterious plague had broken out among them, and it killed every man, woman, and child in the tribe. And so complete was the devastation that the neighboring tribes had shunned the area ever since. They were convinced that some great supernatural spirit had destroyed the Patuxets. And that was why the cleared land on which they had settled literally belonged to no one. Their nearest neighbors, said Samoset, were the Wampanoags, about 50 miles to the southeast. These Indians numbered about 60 warriors. Massasoit was their chief, and he had such wisdom that he also ruled over several other smaller tribes in that area. And it was with Massasoit that Samoset had spent most of the past eight months. So by the time Samoset was done talking, it was nightfall. He announced that he would stay the night with them. And in the morning, he left, taking a knife, a bracelet, and a ring as pilgrim's gifts to Massasoit. And that was the last the pilgrims saw of him until the following Thursday, when he returned, along with another Indian who also spoke English, and who, of all things, was a Patuxet. This second Indian was Squanto, and he was, according to Bradford, and I quote, a special instrument sent of God for our good beyond our expectations. Now, I want you to listen to the extraordinary chain of coincidences in this man's life and see if it reminds you of an Old Testament character. Squanto was born in 1585, but his story, as far as we're concerned, really began in 1605 when Squanto and four other Indians were taken captive by an English sea captain who was exploring the New England coast. And the Indians were taken to England, where they were taught English so that the people in England could question them as to which tribes populated New England and where the most favorable places to establish colonies might be. Squanto spent the next nine years in England, and while he was there, he met Captain John Smith, recently of Virginia, who promised to take him back to his people on Cape Cod as soon as Smith could get a ship and return to North America. When Smith returned to North America in 1614, Squanto went with him and was returned to his tribe of the Patuxets. Now, sailing with Smith's, uh, with Smith's expedition on another ship was Captain Thomas Hunt. And John Smith ordered Hunt to stay behind, dry their catch of fish, and trade it for beaver skins before crossing the Atlantic and going back to England. But Hunt had more profitable cargo in mind. 
So as soon as Smith left, Hunt went back down the coast where he lured 20 Pawtuxets aboard his ship, including Squanto, apparently to trade, but he promptly imprisoned them. And he took all of them to Malaga, which was a slave trading port on the coast of Spain, and he got 20 pounds apiece for each of them. Today's money, that's approximately $4,800. He made a haul. Most of these Indians were shipped off to North Africa as slaves, but a few, including Squanto, were bought and rescued by local friars. Squanto didn't stay long in the Spanish monastery. He joined up with an Englishman who was headed for London, and there he lived until he went back to New England with another English sea captain in 1619. And so when Squanto stepped ashore six months before the pilgrims arrived, he received the most tragic blow of his life. Not a man, not a woman, not a child of his tribe was left alive. Nothing but bones and ruins. And so in despair, he wandered into Massasoit's camp because he really had nowhere else to go. And the chief, understanding his circumstances, took pity on him. And that was his condition until Samoset brought news of a small colony of peaceful English families who were really hard-pressed to stay alive, let alone plant a colony at Patuxet. They were surely going to die of starvation. They had little food, nothing to plant. And so Squanto accompanied Samoset when the later came to Plymouth as Massasoit's interpreter. The chief himself came, <laughs> but he didn't come by himself. He came with all 60 of his warriors. And Edward Winslow was elected to meet Massasoit and negotiate with the Indian chief. And out of that meeting came a peace treaty of mutual aid and assistance, which lasted for 40 years. Massasoit was a remarkable example of God's providential care for his pilgrims. He was probably the only chief on the northeast coast of America who would have welcomed the white man as a friend. And the pilgrims took great pains not to abuse this acceptance. And the record of their relations with him and his people is just a tremendous testimony to the love of Christ that was in them. So when Massasoit and his entourage finally left, Squanto stayed. He would teach the pilgrims how to fish, how to plant corn the Indian way, how to stock deer, how to plant vegetables, how to refine maple syrup, how to, to discover which herbs were good to eat and which were good for medicine, where to find the best berries, and most importantly after the corn, how to trap beaver for their pelts. What Old Testament character does Squanto remind you of? Joseph. And so under Squanto's teaching, things began to go really well until Governor Carver, the governor of the colony, was suddenly struck down with what was probably a cerebral hemorrhage, and he died in three days. His replacement by unanimous vote was William Bradford. And William Bradford would be re-elected annually for the next 36 years of his life, except for the five years when he specifically requested that they choose someone else. Now, I hope that you realize how unique Governor Bradford's situation was. How can anyone get reelected to the same political post 30 times and not abuse it? But as usual, we find our answer in scriptures. Let's look at Mark 10, verses 42 and 45. Here's what it says. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And this concept of a servant leader will appear over and over and over again in our study. Despite what today's textbooks say, the study of history is primarily the study of the men and the women who were leaders, who influenced events. And I submit to you that if our leaders today had a servant's heart the way men like William Bradford did, we wouldn't need to be talking about scandals and cover-ups and draining the swamp and political corruption. Limbaugh and Hannity and the rest of the commentators would be out of a job. Our founding fathers embraced this concept of a servant leader. Only they didn't use that term. They used another term. The term they used was statesman. And that was the word they used to describe those people who refused to compromise their principles, who instead answered first and foremost to Almighty God. Now, I could share with you many of our founders' thoughts on this topic, but I thought John Adams, our second president, said it best. Now, this entry was in his diary on Sunday, February 9th, 1772, before the country was even founded. First, he described those leaders who have succumbed to worldly temptation, that is, who are not statesmen. And he called them, ready, politicians. <laughs> this is what he had to say about why he wanted to be a statesman and not a politician. And I quote from his diary. We see every day their imaginations are so strong and their reason so weak, the charms of wealth and power are so enchanting, and the belief of future punishments so faint that men find ways to persuade themselves to believe any absurdity, to submit to any prostitution, rather than forgo their wishes and desires. Their reason becomes at last an eloquent advocate on the side of their passions and they bring themselves to believe that black is white, that vice is virtue, that folly is wisdom, and eternity just a moment. And then he went on in that diary passage to explain why he could not compromise his principles. And I want you to listen very carefully, and I'm quoting again. I dread the consequences. To require of me such compliances, such horrid crimes, and such a sacrifice of my honor, my conscience, my friends, my country, my God, as the scriptures inform us must be punished with nothing less than hellfire, eternal torment. And this is so unequal a price to pay that I cannot prevail upon myself to think of it. The duration of future punishment terrifies me. Adams believed that only through a conviction of the truth of Scripture and the reality of hell could you resist the temptation to compromise. And that was the prevailing attitude of our founding fathers 240 years ago. And that, in a nutshell, is why the church and the state should never be separated. And today's church, for the most part, just doesn't get it. Well, under the servant leadership of Governor Bradford, things went well for the pilgrims during the summer of 1621. That fall's harvest provided more than enough corn to see them through their second winter. And the pilgrims were very grateful. 
not only to Squanto and the Wampanoags who had been so friendly, but to God himself. In him they had trusted, and he had honored their obedience beyond their wildest dreams. So Governor Bradford declared a day of public thanksgiving to be held in October. Massasoit was invited, and unexpectedly he came a day early with 90 Indians. And that caused an immediate problem for the pilgrims, because to feed that type of a crowd would cut very deeply into the food supply that was supposed to get them through that winter. But if they had learned one thing, it was to trust God. And as it turned out, the Indians were not arriving empty-handed. They arrived with five dressed deer, more than a dozen wild turkeys, and they helped with the preparations, teaching the pilgrim women how to make hoe cakes and a tasty pudding out of cornmeal and maple syrup. And the pilgrims, in turn, provided many vegetables from their household gardens. And using some of their precious flour, they took the summer fruits, which the Indians had dried, and they introduced the Indians to the likes of blueberry, apple, and cherry pie. Now, I want you to notice one thing. No pumpkin pie. No popcorn. Those are myths. <laughs> Things went so well that Thanksgiving Day was extended for three additional days. About a month later, in November 1621, a whole year after they had first arrived, the first ship from home dropped anchor in the harbor. The ship was on her way to Virginia, but they left a cargo at Plymouth, 35 more colonists. But these colonists hadn't brought one bit of equipment with them, no food, no clothing, no bedding, nothing, no tools. So Bradford, Brewster, and Winslow made an immediate decision. They would all have to go on half rations through the winter. And so, just like Jamestown earlier, the pilgrims entered their own starving time that winter of 1621-1622. And ultimately, they were reduced to a daily ration of five kernels of corn apiece. I'm not talking about ears of corn. I'm not talking about those little mini ears that you can get at the grocery store. I'm talking about five kernels of corn. And this wasn't just for a day or two. It went on for multiple weeks. But as always, they had a choice. They either could give in to the bitterness and despair, or they could go deeper into Christ, and they chose Christ. And in contrast to what happened at Jamestown, not one of them died. Then God had mercy on them, as he had so often in the past. Unexpectedly, a ship put into their harbor from Virginia on its way back to England, and the pilgrims traded beaver pelts for corn, and they were able to thank God for seeing them through that winter. Another year passed. It was now April of 1623, time to get the year's corn planted. But as the pilgrims went into the fields to till the ground and to put in their seeds, the leaders noted a listlessness about them that was more than just weakness from months and months of poor rations. They knew that they needed at least twice as great a yield as the first harvest, and they didn't want a repeat of the half-hearted effort of the second summer when they had been so busy building houses and planting gardens to give the common cornfields the attention they needed. So the principal men of the colony got together, and they decided that the, there would be a second additional planting. But for the second planting, individual lots would be parceled out with the understanding that the corn grown on these lots would be for the planter's own private use. And suddenly, new life seemed to come upon the pilgrims. Why? It's called capitalism, free enterprise. Bradford wrote these words, and I quote, 
it made all hands very industrious. Really? So as much more corn was planted than otherwise, the women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set the corn, which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. Did you know that the Bible clearly teaches that a role of government should be to support a free enterprise system? That's a system that rewards profits. You don't believe me? In your spare time this week, read Luke 19. Check out the parable of the landowner in Matthew chapter 20. The Bible does not support socialism or communism as appropriate forms of government for God's people. And we need to know that going into this November's election. Now, sometime after the second planning, this was the one for their own private use, it became clear that the dry spell which had begun between the two plantings was turning into a drought. Week followed week, it would continue for 12 weeks in all, and not even the oldest Indians in that area could remember anything like it. Edward Winslow described the drought and what followed, and I'm taking this from his diary. I quote, there scarce fell any rain so that the stock of that planting which was first set began to send forth the ear before it came to half growth and that which was later not like to yield any at all, both blade and stock hanging the head and changing the color in such manner as we judged it utterly dead. Our beans also ran not up according to their wonted manner, but stood at a stay, many being parched away as though they had been scorched before the fire. Now were our hopes overthrown, and we discouraged, our joy turned into mourning. So what did the pilgrims do? Well, I'm going to give you an oral multiple choice test. You raise your hands when you think you've heard the right answer. A, they all enrolled in the National Food Stamp Program. <laughs> B, they petitioned the Indians for disaster relief aid. C, they conducted a comprehensive two-year study costing millions of dollars only to determine that the drought was caused by global warming. Don't see any hands yet. D, they drafted a 2,700-page statute called the Affordable Care Act on their printing press to take care of those who got sick and couldn't afford health insurance. E, all of the above. No? Okay. Here's what the pilgrims really did. And if you listen closely, I think we'll discover something that might even be applicable today. Edward Winslow again. These and the like considerations moved not only every good man privately to enter into examination with his own estate between God and his conscience, and so to humiliation before him, but also to humble ourselves together before the Lord by fasting and prayer. And to that end, a day was appointed by public authority and set apart from all other employments. Did you hear that? They fasted and they prayed, everyone. Now, at this point, I need to ask a hard question. If we had been pilgrims, how would we have responded after months and months of always going hungry? And I submit, if we looked at ourselves, we would have been out there, just like the pilgrims were, planting as many kernels of corn as we possibly could. And not just to make sure that we'd never be hungry again. We'd have been planning on what we're going to get in trade for those extra ears that we harvested. And you know, God probably wouldn't have been anywhere in sight. 
we would have been so totally absorbed in looking out for our own interests. And if the fellow next door didn't do as well as we did, well, too bad for him. You see, the moment greed and self begin to get the upper hand, there isn't any difference between golden kernels of corn and golden coins. Here's what Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 through 18 say, says. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when, there, when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rock of Flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Now I want you to listen to this. The sincere and the deep repentance of each and every pilgrim had a phenomenal effect. Winslow continues in his diary this way, and I quote, But oh, the mercy of our God, who was as ready to hear as we were to ask. For though in the morning when we assembled together, the heavens were as clear and the dry drought as like to continue as it ever was, yet our exercise continuing some eight or nine hours before our departure, the weather was overcast. The clouds gathered on all sides. Did you hear that? They prayed eight or nine hours. On the next morning, the very next day, distilled such soft, sweet, and moderate showers of rain, continuing some 14 days, and mixed with such seasonable weather, as it was hard to say whether our withered corn or drooping affections were most quickened or revived, such was the bounty and goodness of our God. Bradford wrote these words, it came without either wind or thunder or any violence, and by degrees in that abundance as that the earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quicken the decayed corn and other fruits as was wonderful to see and made the Indians astonished to behold. The yield that year was so abundant that the pilgrims ended up with a surplus of corn which they were able to use in trading that winter with northern Indians who had experienced the same drought conditions. A second day of Thanksgiving was planned, and this year, 1623, there was even another reason to celebrate, because Governor Bradford was marrying Alice Southworth. Massasoit was again the guest of honor, and this time he brought his principal wife, three other chiefs, and 120 braves. And fortunately, he again brought venison and turkey. <laughs> the occasion was described by one of the adventurers, Emmanuel Alton, in a letter back home to his brother in England. And here is what he wrote. And now to say somewhat of the great cheer we had at the governor's marriage. 
We had about 12 tasty venisons beside others, pieces of roasted venison and such other good cheer in such quantities that I wish you some of our share. For here we have the best grapes that you ever saw and the biggest and diverse sorts of plums and nuts, goats, about 50 hogs and pigs, also diverse hens. A better country was never seen nor heard of, for here are a multitude of God's blessing. That was an adventurer. That wasn't one of the separatists. And he was talking of God's blessing on that colony. But what Altam neglected to mention was that the first course that was served to everybody present on an empty plate in front of each person were five kernels of corn so that no one would forget. These pilgrims, just a mere handful of Christians, but William Bradford later would write these words, and that was part of the second quotation that you have in your materials. As one small candle may light a thousand, so the light kindled here is shown unto many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. And we have noted these things so that you might see their worth and not negligently lose what your fathers have obtained with so much hardship. May we heed those words today. Candle had been set at Plymouth. But what about the candles still in England? What about the Puritans? You'll have to come back next week to find out about them. Now, I've got, before we close, I just want to ask a couple of questions. How many of you out there have heard these stories that I've shared the past two weeks? How many? Shouldn't our young people know them? I want you to just think how many providential occurrences occurred in what we have just talked about the last two weeks. I can think of at least six. The iron screw of the printing press, the death of the Pawtuxets, the friendship of Massasoit, Squanto, the five kernels of corn and no deaths, the ending of the drought. Shouldn't those types of things make us more determined to preserve our religious heritage and our religious history and our freedoms? This is our Christian heritage. You know, the Lord, in Deuteronomy 6, said the same thing that Bradford did. Verses 6 to 9. You might know it as the Shema. It says, you shall love your Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." How many of us are doing that on a regular basis? Again, we have noted these things so that you might see their worth and not negligently lose what your fathers have attained with so much hardship. That's the lesson this evening. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for the story of the pilgrims 
we ask that, that you give us the same spirit and the same understanding and the same will to serve you as they had. And Lord, we ask that revival break out in this country just like it broke out in Plymouth. And Lord, we don't want to get in your way. And we know that a God that has performed all these miracles, as far as the pilgrims are concerned, can still do the same thing today if we just give him a chance. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Give the Lord a praise offering.